Okay, the technical details are now fixed, so now you can hear us also. Welcome anyhow to the, the webinar, today's webinar that we're focusing on putting circular solutions in the front seat. My name is Per Larsson, I'm Head of Sustainability for Rang Sales Group. And with me here in the studio in, in Sweden, I have Jureb Cohen, Head Thank of you. Research and Development at EC Mining. We have three speakers externally in Denmark that we will come back to and introduce later on. The whole seminar will be held in English and please put your questions to the speakers as they speak. We will take your questions in the end where we have a small discussion with, with all the speakers. Uh, what we do is that we present a solution that really can recircle back, recirculate back resources that are critical that we know that society will need going forward. At the same time, we'll also be able to, to secure how we can use the leftovers in order to, to uh, produce concrete and replace and reduce the need of today's production. There are some questions that I definitely would like to have straightened out during this seminar. And one, of course, is how much of the sewage sludge that can be recirculated. I hope that we find the question on that one. And of course, also to understand how much carbon uh, emissions that we can reduce by using all the resources. So I'm really looking forward uh, by myself to understand what are the potential. Uh, let's start with the global perspective. In 2015, uh, we did sign the Paris Agreement, stating that the, we should stay below uh, 2.0 degrees increase in temperature down to 1.5 degrees. Uh, and uh, I would say all up till 2019, the focus was just on energy and transport, meaning that we should change our, the way how we power our engines and how we are, how we are, are, are running our transport sector. Uh, the thing is that in 20, 2019, uh, Metro Economics launched a report together with, with, uh, with and, and ahead of the COP conference in Madrid. And it was clarified that almost 50% of the carbon emissions are embedded in the material that we are producing. It is also in how we are producing food and using our forestry. So it is, will not enough be enough just focusing on the energy sector. We need to make sure also that we create circular loops that will be critical. Uh, I, was, I had the opportunity to be at the COP25 by myself and uh, take part in the discussions. And even in all the negotiation, of course, the discussion was about the carbon emissions. How can we reduce energy and transportation? But when I listened to the ministers, when they were, more, were not negotiating, everybody talked about the need of creating circular loops. This seminar, we tried to highlight that and exactly give examples how we can secure and create more circular loops. In Europe, uh, we have the new Green Deal launched by the European Commission. It is on a very high level, and we need really to put detailed efforts and detailed programs now in place. There's one thing that I would like to stress that is very important going forward, if we would like to create circular loops, is that we then replace today's uh, basic principle, meaning that 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 uh, origin comes before quality. It means that if you mine, as an example, phosphorus today from Morocco, and then uh, uh, you have almost no problems to use it as a fertilizer within Europe. When it comes to when it comes to recycled uh, phosphorus from from uh, sludge, it is stopped. So the thing is that even if it's much higher quality you're not able to use it. So uh, if you recycle it from, from Europe, you need to export it out of Europe. And of course, that needs to be changed. In Sweden, at the same time, uh, we have a strategy in place now, and uh, it's really promising. It both targeting the importance of, of creating uh, circular resources and focusing on the resources. At the same time, that it also uh, are targeting the importance of detoxification. And uh, you need those in combination. It is very important. For many years, there has been a, there's been a circular agenda in place in the Netherlands and in Finland and in several countries. 
uh, but it's very important now that they they join hands and go together, and that we now stop just talking on the high level. We need to do the concrete examples. Rang Cells, as a company, we are family owned, and Easy Mining is a part of Rang Cells Group. Easy Mining is our innovation company. When we started Rang Cells in in the, and, and our legacy comes from the late 1880s when we were a transport company. We transported, in, in this case, with, with horse carriages, we transported latrines from the city of Stockholm out to the different farms uh, outside of Stockholm. So already back then, we started with, with nutrient recovery or recirculating of nutrients. Um, today, we are doing it by spreading sludge uh, uh, in Sweden. But tomorrow, we will do it on a global level giving support and be able to then, then, then be a raw material producer in, in tomorrow's circular economy. Uh, our commitment to the future is that we understand that we need to then develop new solutions. And I will now give you how we are developing our principles when we are doing our research and development. So please, if we can now share uh, the three principles that are basic in how we are, are are re, uh, developing research and development. The first principle is that we should secure that every solution that we put in on the market should recirculate back as much resources as possible, meaning that we can reduce the need of virgin production somewhere else. Secondly, we need to make sure that we decontaminate, meaning that we then can take away unwanted substances as much as possible. And thirdly, of course, we need to make sure that we doesn't create new problems for future generations. You have the biodiversity here, you have the climate issue here, uh, and so, and you, of course, other environmental challenges. And one example, one concrete example of this is how we have now are investing in another facility in, in Stockholm, where we have, uh, where we will recirculate and extract uh, different kinds of salts out of fly ash. Fly ash is today a problematic waste where that are needed to be landfilled. But uh, Easy Mining and Jorev has developed a solution where we can separate the salts and bring them back to the market. The interesting part here is that the, the leftover is, uh, has, the sh has the same chemical substance as Portland cement, meaning that it can be hopefully developed and, and then replace the need for, for uh, limestone juice in the concrete industry. It will take two years before we have the first factory up and running, but then we will start producing. That's another process that we have developed, but today we will start focusing on the ash to fast process. Before I introduce the first speaker, I must say that I was very happy yesterday when I read the news about uh, uh, what the what Samantha and Heidelberg has said. They will now try to replace uh, their, their, the way how they power their, their, their cement factory in, in Gotland. But the thing is that the energy production, just to switch the energy, will just reduce the, the carbon emissions by something like 30 or 40 percent. So in order to create and achieve the Paris Agreement, we need to make sure also that we, that we change the processes. So that it means that we need to also understand what we're putting in the process, what material we're putting in it. So uh, by that, I would like now to hand over to our first speaker. And uh, this is now uh, from Biofoss in Copenhagen. It's Dina Storberg. I was very pleased to be able to visit you in, in Copenhagen for two years ago. And I did see a fantastic plant. And, and I know that you have some great stories to tell us now about what, how you are working. Uh, and you are the, the Denmark's largest wastewater company. So please tell us more about how you see that the raw material can be extracted by the ash to fast process. So please go ahead, Dina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, I would like to tell you the story about how this sludge ash is actually uh, arising. Well, what is the origin of the, uh, the sludge ash and the silicate sand? Um, my background is I am the innovation manager in Biofos. I will tell you about Biofos in a minute. Uh, my own background, I am a chemical engineer uh, and also been working with, uh, with wastewater um, in a PhD study, control. 
uh, many years ago. Uh, since then, has been passing 35 years, and now I've uh, been working with wastewater ever since um, in the research and municipalities and so on. Um, so, the biofoss, let's talk about that. And now, yes, um, as the chairman already mentioned, we are the largest wastewater utility in Denmark, so we treat the wastewater of Copenhagen. You can see uh, the, play, the, the situation of Copenhagen in the small map in the corner. If you don't know where Copenhagen is, I guess most of you know that. Um, the capital of Denmark. So we treat the wastewater of 1.2 million people living in Greater Copenhagen. Uh, and uh, as a, a side remark here, I would like to tell you we are also energy positive. We are exporting more energy to the city of Copenhagen than we are using. The three wastewater treatment plants that we uh, we operate, you can see in these pictures here, we have uh, Netten, one million people, population, population equivalent, over there, 400,000, and Damuzon, 350,000, population equivalent. And you will notice uh, this plant here, mono incineration, on this plant it's here, and we have mono incineration here on this plant. You can also see on the picture a big pile of uh, ash, this, this red thing, and trees growing on top of the red thing because of the phosphorus. Uh, we have a large storage of ash. I'll get back to the numbers. And also here you can see this triangle. Uh, I hope you can see my cursor. It's the triangle here in the water. This is also all uh, ash storage. So how does this uh, ash arise? Where does it come from? Well, in this diagram you can see the city, or it is also it's a mix of, uh, of course, household and industry, produces wastewater, this wastewater is uh, treated by us in the wastewater treatment plant. So basically the idea of this whole idea, uh, project is to, uh, to treat water. We want the clean water to the receiving waters uh, in, in Øresund, whatever is around Copenhagen. So the, the main idea is, of course, to treat the water. But uh, as, a, as a part of this process, we, uh, there is digested sludge arising. So the, what we take out of the wastewater is uh, ended up as digested sludge, uh, as you see in this picture over here. We have, uh, this is what it looks like, more or less like uh, earth, you could say, soil. Um, and this digestive sludge we are incinerating, I'll get back to that. And then you have the ash. Now we would like to, uh, to uh, I'll just show you, this is uh, what we are doing in Biofoss. Here we have the sort of the limit of Biofoss. We would like to do something with this ash. Uh, we have a, a, a strategy in Biofoss that we want to participate in uh, in the circular economy. So we would like to sort of make this, pave the way for this ash to be used somehow. And um, you can see here, this is one example of what could be done. This is what we are talking about today, the principle of the uh, the easy mining process, the ash to foss. Um, I, I know Ayari will tell a lot more about that after me, so I will not go into detail, but just you can see here that what we are talking about today, the silicate sand comes out of this process. If we go back to the, the wastewater stream, it's actually because in the wastewater there is sand because we are uh, also uh, flushing roads. You could say the rainwater from the roads and uh, when we, flush, when we uh, wash our potatoes in the kitchen, we also get sand into the wastewater. So there's a lot of rising sand and, and from different sources. And that ends up here as silicate sand. And of course, the, the really valuable thing that we want to uh, recover from this uh, ash is the phosphorus. There's about 10% phosphorus in this ash. The sludge disposal in in, uh, in Europe, the options are these here uh, mainly. The, you can either landfill the sludge from the wastewater treatment plant, you can use it on farmland, or you can uh, dry it and, and use it as fuel and concrete production. This is already happening in some places. Uh, the, the bad thing is that the phosphorus is not recovered uh, if you just use the, the sludge directly in, in uh, concrete or uh, cement production. Um, you can co-incinerate with other uh, types of waste, or you can mono incinerate it. I, I've written here on site, that's what we are doing. You can also mono incinerate uh, in a sort of centralized way like they do in Holland. I will just show you uh, this graph here of the way that different countries in Europe are treating the, or handling their sludge. It's a bit old figure, but I don't think it has changed so much. It's from 2010. In the bottom here, you have the uh, the countries, and you can see the amount of uh, dry matter, tons of dry matter per year. Per, um, for the different countries, of course, Germany is uh, 
by far the largest producer uh, of sludge. And you can see that uh, about half of this, the blue color, it means incineration. So about half of the sludge in Germany is incinerated. Mostly, as I understand it, is uh, as co-incineration, which is going to change because of your changing laws. Um, and as you see, a lot of uh, applications to land, the red ones are, are quite uh, common in, in UK and in Italy, and in, in Spain and France have quite a large amount of sludge going to sludge to uh, farmland. So, um, but also some countries are, are totally incinerating already. If you look at Switzerland, no, not sorry, um, like um, Holland is uh, incinerating all their sludge. So there's it's a very uh, variated picture today, but I think it's going to be more and more towards handling the sludge with incineration because of the, uh, the micropollutants and so on. We have to treat that in some way in the microplastics. We are going more towards the, uh, the incineration route. Here you have a look at the, uh, the incineration plant at uh, Lundetten, our largest treatment plant. This was during construction uh, some years ago. It's about uh, almost 10 years ago. This was constructed. You can see into this uh, hall of the flue gas treatment. And the process is that you start with the digested sludge. This is actually already dewatered in, uh, in um, decanter centrifuges. We have a pre-drying going from uh, this uh, sludge, which is probably about 25% dry matter, going up to 35 or 33% dry matter in the sludge. Then it's ready to put into the oven or the uh, the furnace, whatever you want to call it. So we are we are incinerating the sludge here. Um, there's a lot of heat coming out. I will get I will show you the heat balance just for show you the, the energy in a minute. The most important is this the electrostatic uh, precipitator. This is where we use electricity to uh, to sort of catch the uh, the ash, the fly ash, coming out here. So this is where we uh, the sludge ash is actually coming out of the electric. This one. We also have a backhouse filler, somehow uh, a, a back filler, taking out the the rest of the the ashes, mostly containing uh, mercury and other heavy metals. Then we have to treat the flue gas with a scrubber and a condenser uh, in the Nettenfeld in the case, and then we have the stack, which is um, making the the which is now the the flue gas uh, into the air. So this is the, the basic process of the incineration. The thermal balance, uh, this slide is a bit uh, messy, but um, anyway, you can see here the, the some of the energy streams. You have uh, about 2.35 tons of dry matter coming into this uh, the dryer per hour. When that's the, uh, the maximum uh, load, which we are mostly using in uh, Lunetten. When you calculate the energy content, basically what is the organic content uh, calculated in megawatts is about five. This will be uh, dried to 33 percent. In this, this is an average number. The uh, the heat for this uh, drying is coming from the uh, the incineration. We have uh, some hot oil, so we are more or less wasting 1.2 megawatt here by by this uh, this uh, steam from the uh, the drying. This is going back to the wastewater stream, but we are also uh, preheating incineration a boiler for the hot oil. And I'm sorry, I think I was shortly out. I hope you see my slides by now. I have to. Sh uh, <laughs> I have to go back. Sorry, just a minute. I believe that you know. Uh, sometimes there is a problem with my my Wi-Fi in where I am. So uh, sorry. I hope you see the right picture now. Back to the uh, my yeah you know, my presentation. You uh, you have this hot water going back uh, to the dryer. You have also uh, some still 3.6 megawatt yeah, going down here, which where which 1.9 megawatt is going to district heating. We also condense uh, the uh, the heat from the water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope you're still with me. <laughs> I see I have some problems with my network. Um, the point is on this slide is that we are actually exporting a lot of uh, heat to the uh, Copenhagen district heating system. So we are actually having a positive export of heat and we also have an auto thermal. We don't add any energy to this. So drying the sludge to 33% will give us an auto thermal process, not only auto thermal, but actually with an exp uh, with an, a surplus of energy. So I think this is interesting for maybe some people, uh, some of you who are looking at the uh, incineration in different countries. You can get back to Rampel, they have uh, been uh, participating in this design of the, the, the system, the energy. 
Okay, something about the ash from the incineration. Uh, you can see something about the amounts here. Uh, you can also see uh, the ash lying in the background. This is our storage or the, the uh, landfill. The, uh, the two plants are producing 5,000 and 3,000 tons of ash per year, totally 8,000. We uh, calculate there's about 760 tons of phosphorus in this ash every year. We have been storing it for several years, so we have a landfill which uh, contains about 350,000 tons of, uh, of uh, ashes. And we have uh, estimated there's about 18,000 tons of phosphorus in this. So uh, this is actually, this could, this could also be uh, recovered from the uh, landfill, not only the, the, the running production, but also the landfill could be interesting for what we are talking about today. The ash composition, just uh, I, I will immediately apologize that some of the headlines are in Danish, but uh, I think you can understand most of it. This is just to tell you a little about the composition of the heavy metals that you see over here. I think for, for any German participant, it's easy to understand this. Uh, the point in this slide is that we have this uh, the, the standards for, for sludge. If you want to put sludge on farmland, you have these uh, limits for, for the different heavy metals, uh, at least in Denmark. Um, and what you see here is that, that mostly, if you look at the maximum values, they, uh, the, the ash is actually uh, complying with these uh, limits mostly. Uh, so we could put, we could uh, in principle put the ash on farmland uh, as sludge, uh, as fertilizer. We are not doing it. We also see that the chromium here is uh, surpassing in the maximum values. We also have a rising a sink that's going up, so it's not uh, totally clear. But um, so we're not, we, we don't want to put, put this on farmland. Also, the farmers are a bit skeptic about the, 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 uh, the fertilizing value of, of this ash. The, the phosphorus is pretty slow, so we have to think about how you do it anyway. But I know that it's, it's happening in, uh, in some countries. They're thinking about it in Poland and uh, in other places, and also England, actually. I will just end my presentation with this, uh, telling you about uh, we have what I call historic products that we are we have been uh, using the ash uh, in, in production. Rockwool uh, is, has been using uh, about a third of our ashes for some years for, to, to put into uh, Rockwool insulation pads. Uh, it's quite good for, for this, uh, this uh, product, but um, of course the phosphorus also ends up inside these uh, Rockwool pads and then we have lost the phosphorus. So uh, we, we will probably not, we will not put, uh, continue with this. And, um, we also have uh, tested some uh, use of ashes in the um, in some of these concrete products. Um, I just I think I'll just uh, add that I didn't say that on the slide. I wanted to say that uh, we are we have been working a lot together with um, with uh, with Easy Mining. Uh, yeah, we will tell you in a minute about this process. The, th the way we have been working together, we have provided uh, Easy Mining with some ashes from Biofoss. Uh, it was a pretty difficult process. That's another story. But the thing is, we, are, we have not made a contract with Easy Mining. Uh, we, we are in the process now of, uh, of actually having a tendering process with our ashes. So uh, anybody could, can actually uh, come with a bit uh, on our ashes uh, if they want to do something with it. I think I will end my presentation here. So I think it was really interesting. Um, what I take from the presentation was that you said that 10%, almost 10% of today's, uh, of, of the content of the ashes today are phosphorus. 5%, if I calculate correctly, in the old landfills. So you have been better in securing that the, that the phosphorus are not let out in, 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 the, in the Baltic. Is that correct? Yeah. So you're, you're, yeah, maybe Dinas should answer this question. Uh, I guess you have uh, implemented the phosphorus removal uh, more efficient uh, in recent years. Yeah, the point is that the the, 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 that. the, the landfill is containing sludge uh, both be from before we, we put uh, phosphorus demands and, and after. So we have a mix of low containing ashes and high containing ashes, you could say, which in a given average, maybe 5%. So uh, what I calculate anyhow is that in Denmark we have a man-made mine that uh, now start to produce five times, at least five times as much phosphorus in the future as the only mine operating now in Europe, in Silinjärvi, northern Finland. So the potential is that we, we can create uh, mining in the future and hopefully not just in, in, uh, from the, the, your facilities in Copenhagen. By the way, we have 10 people from 10 countries uh, watching our, our presentation, hey now. 
So, so it, the interest is is not just from from Denmark, not just from Sweden, not just from Germany. It, all ten countries are all represented here. The next speaker is uh, Dr. Jorib Cohen from Easy Mining, here directly live from the studio. And Easy Mining is our innovation company that are developing solutions for nutrient recovery, not just phosphorus. I talked about potassium earlier with the new facility we're now building here in Stockholm. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we, we have we have nitrogen, but we're now focusing on the ash to phosphorus process. So please, Jarib, go ahead with your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, as uh, Per introduced me, I'm uh, working as a head of uh, research and development at Easy Mining. Uh, my background is that I have a long experience in uh, chemistry, more than 20 years uh, about phosphorus chemistry, and uh, here in uh, Easy Mining, we have been uh, developing several processes for treating uh, ashes, uh, but also uh, wastewater with a focus on uh, nutrient recycling. Uh, I would like to uh, first thank Dines for the nice presentation, showing the way from seaweed sludge into ash. And uh, I will now uh, go through the ash to phos process and explain how we go from ash and produce this uh, silica uh, sand, which we will talk about uh, later on, and, and the use of it in, in uh, possible uses in, in uh, cement replacement. Um, first, uh, Easy Mining is uh, the innovation company of uh, Rang Cells, and uh, Rang Cells is uh, family-owned company uh, working with uh, uh, handling uh, waste. Uh, in the total group, we handle about uh, 5 million tons of waste per year. And uh, Rang Cells is also the largest actor uh, in Sweden handling seaweed sludge. And as Per uh, mentioned, uh, we have now uh, uh, big plans in going into uh, to be a big player in the circular economy. And um, you can see here in the picture that the first uh, uh, big investment in circular economy, the ash to salt plant with a capacity of over 100,000 tons uh, fly ash uh, per year, which is now being built uh, north of uh, Stockholm. Uh, in easy mining, we uh, work with uh, uh, development of the processes from the lab through piloting and have also an engineering uh, department. Uh, so we will will go the whole way uh, until building full scale plant and um, supporting them. And the processes that we work with are uh, ash to force, which I will talk uh, uh, in this presentation about. We have also uh, a process for production of uh, ammonium phosphate, uh, clean map uh, in an energy efficient way. We have a process for uh, recovering uh, nitrogen. It's a new innovation, which we have received an EU uh, life uh, fund uh, for, for that. And also in this project, we will uh, cooperate with the Bioforce uh, and we'll have a demo unit installed in, in, in Copenhagen uh, next year. And the ash to salt process, which is uh, uh, the full scale plant is being built uh, right now. Uh, so if we go over now to talk about how uh, do we convert sludge ash into uh, recover the phosphorus and the silica sand, I will go over to, to this and I will start by, by just giving some background. Why is it important to recover phosphorus? Uh, in Europe, we are totally dependent on import of phosphorus. There is only a single mine in Finland that provides about 10% of the phosphorus. So 90% of the phosphorus is imported into Europe from outside of Europe. Uh, and they are, there are three main problems associated with that. Uh, one problem is that uh, rock phosphate, which is uh, uh, the raw material for producing phosphorus fertilizers, uh, has in general uh, a high content of uh, heavy metals like uh, cadmium, uranium and so on, which is a, a health problem. Uh, we know that in Sweden, uh, just the cost of, of handling uh, uh, diseases caused to, to, to bones uh, breaking in, in, in elder population is uh, estimated to about 4 uh, billion Swedish crowns. So this is a main problem. 
Uh, another problem is that the rock phosphate, it's a fossil uh, resource which will end up in the future. It has a, a limited lifetime. And another problem is that uh, most of the world uh, reserves are, are uh, in the hands of a single country. It's uh, in, in Morocco. And um, so, so these are problems. Uh, in Europe, we have still a large phosphate industry. Only about 15% of the phosphorus is imported as uh, uh, ready fertilizers. Most of the phosphorus comes into Europe as a raw material as it, and in, is converted into fertilizers in uh, Europe. Uh, later on, we use the phosphorus in agriculture. We, we grow uh, crops, we make food, it goes into the city, ends up in the wastewater treatment, and there we remove the phosphorus efficiently with uh, precipitation chemicals, and the phosphorus ends up in the sludge. And in Europe, as an average, about 50% of the sludge is spread on agriculture land, and the phosphorus is then can be uh, returned. Uh, but if we look at the rest of the 50%, then uh, uh, about 27% uh, of that is not defined in the statistics and is probably used for different other applications, and 25% uh, is being incinerated. And when the sludge in, is incinerated, the ash is in generally landfilled um, today, as um, for instance, as Dean has showed us in the previous presentation. So our ambition uh, is to, to uh, instead of uh, disposing the ash, to, to uh, uh, when the sludge is incinerated, to take the ash and to uh, treat it and to extract the phosphorus so we get the recycling of phosphorus uh, uh, in society. Um, then several countries have actually uh, have seen that phosphorus is very important. For Europe, it is actually listed as a critical raw material in, in Europe. And uh, some countries uh, like Germany have uh, already taken political decision uh, to, to enforce a mandatory uh, phosphorus recovery. And in uh, Germany, uh, wastewater treatment plants that are larger than 50,000 uh, person equivalents are not allowed to spread sludge in, in agriculture, but they also have a requirement to recover phosphorus. And if you incinerate the phosphorus, it's 80% uh, of the phosphorus from the ash should be recovered. Uh, Switzerland have similar, uh, similar uh, uh, political uh, uh, mandatory phosphorus re uh, recovery, and Austria is coming uh, after. And we believe that uh, more uh, countries in Europe will follow this uh, trend. Uh, the ash to force process, uh, we take the ash, uh, it's a wet chemical process, we dissolve it in acid. The main input chemicals are uh, acid and lime. Uh, we remove the heavy metals for disposal. Uh, we can recover the iron and aluminium that are present in the ash uh, and to reuse them as a precipitation chemicals in wastewater treatment plants. Uh, and of course, we get the clean phosphorus that uh, can be uh, recycled in agriculture. Uh, and uh, we get also a byproduct, the sand that Dinas uh, uh, talked about, it ends up in the sludge. We uh, do not dissolve it in the acid, and then we get uh, uh, a residue which we call uh, silica sand, which we will talk later on today um, about. Uh, the recovery rate for phosphorus is high, uh, more than 90%. Uh, aluminium is also generally high, 60 to 80%. Uh, recovery for iron is lower if we focus on phosphorus only, then it's about 10 to, to uh, 20%. And the recovery rate for calcium is uh, high, above 90%. Uh, the main uh, advantage of the ash to force uh, process is that we have a detoxification process that independent on the quality of the incoming ash, we get a very, very high, uh, pure, premium, uh, recovered phosphorus. And in these uh, um, slides here, you can see the reduction in heavy metal content, and you can see that many of the heavy metals we reduce to 99%. So actually, the recovered phosphorus is the cleanest phosphorus product available uh, today in the market. So it's not only recycled, it's also very, very high quality. 
And this is a ma major benefit when, when recycling phosphorus from ash. During the incineration process, you remove all the, the nanoplastic organic contaminants and so on. And then in the ash treatment process, we remove the heavy metal. So we get a very, very clean uh, recovered phosphorus product. Uh, so from the process, we get uh, phosphorus in form of uh, precipitated calcium phosphate of a very, very high uh, uh, quality. And this can actually be used uh, as a raw material for both fertilizers and also for feed phosphates. It's uh, qualified for the uh, feed uh, quality. Uh, and it can actually be used by any existing process to convert to any existing uh, end product. So it's a very versatile uh, product. Uh, we also recover the iron in form of iron chloride, uh, ferric chloride that we can uh, reuse in wastewater treatment and get a loop for the iron. And the same goes for the aluminium. We can recover aluminium uh, as uh, other coagulant or as uh, zeolite for detergents or as uh, aluminium hydroxide uh, for different industrial applications. Uh, the heavy metal we remove as a sludge for disposal. And then we get about 50% of the ash becomes uh, a silica sand, uh, which we will focus now in this uh, um, webinar about the possible uses of the silica sand. Here I just would like to show you some picture from the pilot. You can see uh, the white material on the filter, on the belt filter is the recovered phosphorus. You can see that it's a very white, pure, clean, uh, Dines have showed you a picture of the ash, which has a, a reddish color, and you can see that it's uh, very, very clean coming up uh, out from this uh, process. And then, of course, the silica sand is, uh, you can see here on the picture to the left, and what we will talk today is about the possibilities of using it as uh, uh, raw material in, in uh, concrete production. Uh, as Dinas mentioned, we have made uh, tests with the ash from uh, Biofos. Uh, it took some time to, to, to uh, export it to, to Sweden, uh, but we have made uh, tests with uh, the fresh ash, but also uh, made tests with the ash from the landfill that you can see here on, on the picture, and we can uh, uh, see that it works. We can process uh, both fresh ash and also ash coming from the landfill. And uh, now we are uh, in the process of uh, uh, the permit application for uh, uh, ash to foss plant in the south of Sweden, in Hel Helsingborg. Uh, we are actually looking there at the Chimera site in Helsingborg. You can see uh, on the, this um, short movie here, uh, there is an existing building. It's uh, an existing factory that we are uh, putting in the ash to foss process in this existing building. The building is much larger than is needed actually, but uh, for, for the process, but since it exists there and you can see in the building, we have also the transporter for the ash. Um, uh, we can use uh, uh, some infrastructure in, in this site. And now we are in the process of uh, the permit application is being applied and we are waiting for, for um, get the permit for this uh, site. Uh, Easy Mining and the Rung Cells have also entered a partnership with uh, Gelsenwasser, which is a large uh, German company that uh, owns about 60 wastewater treatment plants and is now in the process of building uh, uh, sludge incinerators. Uh, and in this partnership, we uh, would like to uh, together uh, build ash to force uh, plants in, in uh, Germany and uh, uh, start with, with uh, we're looking at two locations in, in Germany right now, and we will soon decide on the location and apply for the permit for the first ash to foss uh, plant together with Gelsenwasser. Uh, and this is just a little bit about the timeline and the roll up of the ash to foss process. As I mentioned, we are now in the permit application for the Helsingborg plant, and then we look at about 30,000 tons uh, ash per year. And we are also looking at uh, uh, another ash to foss in Germany with uh, about the same capacity. We look at, uh, at the Bitterfeld site in Germany and also in another site in Germany. Uh, and then, of course, we uh, intend to, to uh, expand the production 
2026, we uh, believe we will have another 60,000 ton uh, plant uh, ongoing. Uh, so here you can see a little bit about the figures of how much PCP, precipitated calcium phosphate, we get, and also the silica sand. That from the first plant, it will be about uh, 23,000 tons of uh, silica sand per year coming up. Yes, this was uh, my presentation, and I hope you could follow the process from ash into silica. Thank you, Ariel. Uh, there's a question already that has been put to you, that is, what do we do with heavy metals? But I would like to, I'd like to answer that question, because this is extremely interesting for the future. Uh, what we need to do is that we need to make sure that we can store those minerals. We need to store those heavy metals for the future and securing that we can be enough, it can be a large uh, an, enough amount of it, because then we can then develop new processes that we can then separate the metal in itself. But we will store it. We make sure that it doesn't get disposed or get thrown away. We secure it for the future. That is the, the direct answer. So uh, nothing will be waste in the future. Everything will be a, a part of the circular economy. That's That's for sure. My, my feeling, yes, we're talking about the low energy process at the same time as we detoxify. So you are really hitting the, the bottoms of, of our, our three, three principles here. We talk about detoxification, we talk about securing resources. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I understand this also becomes then a, a carbon reduction, reduction. So it will be really the carbon sink. Each, each uh, factor that it will up will, will be. Um, positive, have a positive climate effect. How positive it is, we'll need to understand because I think the silica sand will be very important. If, the more we can use of that, the more we re reduce the emissions. We'll come back with more questions to you later, Jerry, mm -hmm. but thank you. So now we will we'll deep dive into the research, and I'm very happy to be able to introduce uh, Lisbeth Ottesen, professor at the Technical University of Denmark. Uh, you are head of section of materials and durability at the university. Uh, and by that, you're an expert on materials and durability. And you will present the results from the study where we have studied the silica sand and the ability to use it and create sustainable or green concrete. So please, back to Denmark and to you, Lisbeth. Thank you for this very kind introduction. Um, as you just introduced me, I'm the professor at the Technical University of Denmark, uh, where I'm also a section head of a, a section called Materials and Durability. And I'm uh, what you could call a nerd on materials, but I am also highly interested in the circular economy and therefore I enjoy uh, participating in this very interesting project. The presentation is, as you just heard, it's about the use of the silica sand and how can we actually use it in concrete. I hope you see my slides. You know now, because you just saw it from the Arif, that this is how the silica sand looks. Is this a resource? Is this a resource we can use in concrete? Well, let's see if we can answer or partly answer this question in this presentation. This is concrete as we know it. Actually, maybe you know already, but I'd like to, to stress that concrete is actually the second most consumed material in the world. We use three tons per year for every person in the world. It is really major amounts of concrete that we use. Um, actually, concrete is used twice as much as all other construction materials in uh, combined, so it is it is really, really an important uh, material in the construction industry, and we use, as I said, so much of it. And since we're using so much concrete, we also, well, most of it is based on, on, uh, on natural resources. The production is based on natural resources. It's also vast, vast amounts of natural resources that we use in the concrete production. And therefore, when we look into circular economy, it would be really nice and it would be very beneficial to the environment and maybe also to the economy if we can use more secondary resources in the production. And there's also this with concrete that uh, an important part of the concrete is cement. 
And the cement production is responsible for 5 to 8% of the anthropogenic CO2 emissions worldwide. And a lot of this, you cannot even avoid it because it's in the production. It's because you burn or you heat up calcium carbonates and the carbon it goes to the air and this is the part of the process which you cannot avoid. So cement, there is a major CO2 emission from the cement production. And then I just wanted to stress that basic concrete, it's a mix of stone, sand, water and cement. Because I'm going to use this in the, in the next part of the presentation. This is what it is. Actually, it is. it seems very simple. As I said, these basic components and you mix it and then you get this hardened concrete. But of course, there's a lot more into it. So let's dive into it. I'll, this presentation will have two parts. First, we'll evaluate how the uh, um, silica sand, well, here I termed it SSA, but it is a silica sand from the easy mining process can use, be used as sand replacement. And this is focusing on resource savings. And then also, can it be used actually as cement replacement? And this would be uh, uh, targeting both resource savings and CO2 emission savings. So at first, we go to the sand replacement. This is how it looks if you go to the microscope and look into the silica sand. We can see that we have these, well, the silica particles, the quartz particles are the white light particles. So we have a lot of it that's why we call it the silica sand. And then we also have what gives a nice reddish color. It's the iron precipitates. And you can also see them easily here on the in the particles. So this is actually how it looks. It's not uh, totally red. It's not all particles which are red, but it's a, a, a fraction like this, fractionation like this. So aggregates, it's sand and coarse uh, stone uh, and, and stone particles in, in the concrete. And it's very important because in the concrete, it is the skeleton. You could call it the skeleton. And you need a very good packing in order to have a good concrete. And here to the left, I've tried to show you what a good packing means. It means that you have a lot of different sizes of the particles. So you have little voids, little, little left for the cement uh, and, and air voids in the concrete, which is the white here. A poor packing means that we need a lot of cement, and it also means that we have a lot of, of uh, possibilities to have air voids in the concrete. So when you want to optimize your concrete, you always go for a good packing. And of course, it's well known what is a good packing, what does it mean, what uh, grain size distribution do we need if we want that one. And therefore, you always, if you want to go into your new aggregates, you need to see what is the grain size distribution. And it is what I've shown over here on, on, the, on the graph, where you can see I have, it's, it's like you normally do, I accumulate the weight on the y-axis and on the x-axis, I have the grain sizes in millimeters. And this one is the grain size distribution of silica sand. And the, the sand, which is very good and often mixed into concrete, has this light gray, um, uh, grain size distribution, and we can see that it is actually quite different. But if we mix 10%, which we try in this uh, investigation here, if we mix 10% of the silica sand into the uh, normal sand, then you'll have a grain size distribution, just like the dotted line here. And I would say that this looks very nice, so it, it might be very useful. I think we will get a very good packing from this, or we will get a very good packing from this. We cannot replace all the sand because you can see if the silica sand has far too much of the fine fraction in it to have a good packing as shown here. But when we mix it, we have a good and promising curve. So we cast the concrete with 10% of replacement of the sand with silica sand. And we use the reference recipe from European standard. To our investigation and uh, I'd say that we also try to mix just 10% of replacement of the mixture um, of, of the silica sand into the mixture but you could not cast it it was simply too dry so we needed to do something and why was it too dry it might be for two reasons it uh, at, we know for sure that the silica sand sort of took the water from the mixing process. So maybe it's porous. There's a lot of, of uh, papers claiming that uh, sewage sludge as particles are porous, and I guess that would also go for the silica sand. And when I showed you the photo before, we could also see that there's a major surface area because uh, uh, the particles, I can go back and show you again. 
here, you can see these, you can imagine here that there is a major, major surface area here. And this surface area takes a layer of water before you have moisture into your, um, into your mixture. So therefore it was too dry. It cannot be mixed if you just take the recipe from, from the standard and mix and, and, uh, and uh, replace 10%. It's simply not possible. So therefore you need to add extra water. And this is what I shown in this table. Um, that we have here a 10% replacement with extra water. I have the number, it's 50 grams extra compared to 225, what is in the reference. Um, and um, you don't just add extra water to concrete. It's not that simple because when you add extra water, then you change the water to cement ratio. And if you are working with concrete, you know that we always talk about the water to cement ratio. How much water is that compared to cement by mass? And this is a major important factor because it simply is uh, determining the strength of the concrete. So if we add extra water, we'll get a weaker concrete. All other things the same. But it's not so easy if you have porous particles, if you have these particles with the high surface area, actually to know how much of the water do you need to calculate into the water to cement ratio. So it's not a one to one. And it, it, this is a, an, an issue which is, well, we have it here with the silica sand, but it's an issue if you want to use recycled concrete aggregate sand, it's the same issue. So it's an issue that we are researching a lot into in other areas as well, but it's not it's not a very easy task, even though it, it could seem from the very beginning. So it means that it's um, uh, that, that we need to learn how to calculate the water to cement ratio in porous, uh, porous sands like this one. But as I said, we casted it. You can see it here. It is actually still not very smooth. It's not very nice looking. Um, and it has. Um, you can see it, it has a lot of larger pores, it has a lot of air in it mixed into it, and it, it's not really like it's, it's a smooth surface. You can also see these uh, different colors. So these 50 grams of water was probably not enough. And over here I show, okay, I just need to move something here because otherwise I cannot see it myself. Ah, sorry, can you still see my slides? Yeah, well, I cannot now. Yes, yes. The problem is I cannot see it. <laughs> How do I get back to my slides? Any suggestions? I think you can choose in the bottom, maybe the two, two Teams windows. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry for this. I have no idea. Can you see in them now again? Yeah, they come down. Uh, <laughs> That's very good. OK, there's now? something in front of my graph over here, so I don't see it very clearly, actually. Um, and it's a pity I want to move this one. Ah, now good. It has been fantastic so far, so. Yeah, that's go good. Now we, now we move on again. Thank you very much. So here we go. What I have over here on the graph, where you can see the green bar, it's the reference. It's the compressive strength of the reference mortar after this uh, recipe. And then I have six replicates. You always make six replicates. But what I wanted to show you, since I show all of them and not just the average, is that there is a major, major difference between these. And of course, we don't want this. If you wanted to mix the concrete, you would have to go with the lowest one to make sure that this is a safe one. And you can see here, I really have a low one. So I did have not optimized the process here. It's uh, it, as it is with this mixture, you simply cannot use it. But what, what could be done, goes here, you need to do further work because you need to use plasticizers. So it means if you use a plasticizer, you can use less water, but still have the same workability. That means that you can cast it even though you have less water than I have added here. So I would suggest that this would be the next research. In this project, we tested if it, if, if it could be used as a one-to-one -to, -one to sand, it cannot. We need to use the pesticizer, uh, and this is the next step. 
uh, I have, have I've, I'm quite certain that this can be done with the plasticizers. This is what concrete industry always do. But as a one-to-one -one replacement, we cannot suggest we cannot suggest it because it has uh, too large variety, and you also have a loss in compressive strength. So let's go and see what about the cement replacement. Well, here I will say that uh, at first that we have these results. We built them. We built them on top of something else, and now it happened again. The slides disappeared to me. I just do it again. What I did before. Um, and this is uh, the work that we have. We, we've uh, been working with sewage sludge assays and treated sewage sludge assays for phosphorus recovery. We had two years ago, we finished a PhD study at our department. And this was about other treatments, not, not the, the silica sand as we have it today, but other ashes which were quite similar. So we built the next research here, the research in this project, the current project, we built it on top of this. So I'd say now that uh, cement is the glue in the concrete. This is what makes the concrete sticks together. So it's really, really important. And this is what gives the strength, as I just mentioned before, in the water to cement ratio. I want to remind you that it is a very good idea to replace cement because, as I said, cement production is a major issue in the, the CO2 emissions from anthropogenic sources. And if we can replace cement, it's also, it is a one-to-one -one, uh, replacement uh, for the CO2 emissions, if we can replace it with waste products like this one. So in the thesis shown to the right, we know new, or we showed that 20% cement replacement can potentially uh, be done if you use milled ash or uh, uh, milled treated ashes. So in the current project, we investigate if we neutralize this sand by washing, can it also here be uh, used as 20% of replacement? And it is, um, it is washed to neutralize it at uh, easy mining. Uh, we know from the other report over here that it's problematic if you ask it was the silic, uh, the uh, sewage sludge ash, and then you have a, a sand afterwards, which is really acidic. It's problematic when you mix it into concrete. So therefore, in this project, we took it over and said, okay, we neutralize it before we mix it into the concrete. So it's washed to take out the remaining acid from it. So for this castings with 20% of, of cement replacement, we uh, used both sand as received just to see what it was, how it went, and then we milled it. And that was also on top of the other report because in that one we saw that it gave much, much better results when we milled it. Uh, we milled it for 10 seconds, which is very low uh, time, and then also for three minutes. And when you mill such a product for three mill a minute, something else happens because it starts to heat up. So it's not just the milling for the three minutes, it's not, not just a size fractionation, it also starts to heat up. So it's, it's not exactly the same product. So what we did was we took, as you can see up here, uh, we took 20% uh, in all, 20% uh, replacement in these two, and then we just, ah, we were just curious to see what happens if we take 30% in the milled one for three minutes. Actually, I would think that we thought that this one would be a good one, but let's see if it was in the graph below. And then you can see here is that we replaced the cement. We kept the water this time. We kept the water the same, so we did not change the water to cement ratio if you uh, calculate it um, on, on, on how you normally do it. Um, and then we replaced some silica sand and the, uh, and then ah here's a mistake because of course we uh, replaced it with sand so it's not uh, one uh, one thousand three hundred fifty here it's decreased here in these but never the mind you can look at this one and see uh, no 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 sorry we took the same part of sand we're talking about cement replacement we use the same amount of sand and now it's not silica sand sorry. Let's look at the results. We have the compressive strength, and now it's the average concentrations because they, it's very stable between the six measurements as it was not before, as I showed you, but in these it is very stable. Here's the reference, and what I show here is the compressive strength after 28 days and after 42 days. And the reason why I do this is that normally you talk about compressive strength after 28 days, because at this point, this is this is standardized to talk about it after 28 days, but you will always gain a bit more strength after 42 days. 
and we've seen with other things and, uh, and uh, other researchers have seen that if you mix in other things, other ashes, for example, cold fly ash, which is used today, if you mix it in, you have a later strength development. So that means that that the, the concrete will ha will have a strength development after the 28 days, which is larger. So I took it also here for 42 days just to make sure or just to investigate whether this uh, compressive strength was increasing more if we use the silica sand. So the reference for the two days, we have it here. Then I only did the as received as the silica sand as received 20% it's here and we can see that we really decrease strength here. And that was also what we saw on the other in the other the old PhD thesis. So we actually just jumped from this one because this decrease is too much. It's, it's not acceptable. But then when we mill it for 10 seconds and we go here and we can see it is almost the same as here. It is a, a small optimization and then we are there. We are simply in this one, we are replacing 20% of the cements without losing uh, strength. And I think this is a very, very good result. Then I, as I said, I milled it for three minutes and we can see there is a small lid type. I think it's probably most, almost the same, but there is a small, small loss here. And if we replace 30%, there is uh, also something that is uh, the loss is, is larger. So what we think is the best one to go with, it's this one. And it has the reason both that it is best one with the strength, but also milling for 10 seconds takes much less energy than if you mill it for three minutes. And then we also out of this that the heating of the ash during the milling can cause uh, different sorts of changes. So this one, I think it is a very, very good result. And it is also the sample that I show over here. You can see it actually has a very good compressive strength. It's 20%. So it's a major, major good result if you, comp if you talk about uh, CO2 emissions. This cement, you could say that this, 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 you know, this concrete, which I show over here, you have 20% less CO2 emission. Well, if, if you calculate it roughly, than in the normal concrete. And then also look at the color. I think it's very, really, really nice color. So it is not just an ordinary concrete. It's an, a concrete which has some aesthetic issues, aesthetic, aesthetic uh, interesting uh, possibilities, aesthetically interesting possibilities. So can we use it directly? Well, OK, I think we need a bit more investigations. You know, if, if you build houses, if you build constructions, if you build structures, then it's always a, a major issue because there's a lot of money involved in it. So we need to make very sure that what we do is the right thing. So I think what we should do now is that we should go into the chemistry of this. There's a lot of potential, but we need to know how does this silica sand influence the hardening process of the of the concrete, for example, the phases which are developed, how are they influenced by the silica sand? And we know that there is some chemical reactivity reacting with the, the concrete. And I know we know it from some investigations we did. You measure uh, setting time is also a, a normal standard procedure if you mix in concrete. It is, you could say this is, uh, this is uh, a measure. You have a needle which is just penetrating your uh, just cast the concrete and then at a certain time the needle will start not to go to the bottom of the concrete anymore and then this is what this curve shows this is for the normal concrete or for for the reference sample we can see that it starts to harden here after maybe 300 uh, minutes and then we can see if we put in this is silica sand this is not uh, milled with silica sand it's delayed and it's even more delayed, the process of hardening is even more delayed if we mix in milled silica sand. So this shows us that there is some chemical reaction. It's not something that we are scared of. It just needs that there's something we need to understand. Sometimes you need, actually, you, you mix in um, chemicals into the concrete because you want a, a slower uh, hardening. Or you want a longer time before the cement hardens. That's, for example, if you transport it long in, in the, the, the trucks where you have your cement. So it's, it's not something that we're scared of. It's just something we need to understand it. And then there's this one, which I think is really, really interesting. And we also need to go more into details with that one. Because porcelanic activity, it's also a and, and uh, it, it's the chemical reactivity of the uh, the positive chemical reactivity of the the uh, here it's it's uh, the silica sand, 
And if we are below this blue line here, there's a positive uh, chemical reaction. It's a pozzolanic uh, activity, we call it. And we can actually see that uh, this, is, this is the sewage sludge as, as received. And here we have the, the silica sand. It's just two batches we got. It's called A and a 2A. <laughs> so it's just two different batches of silica sand. And we can see that it seems like it's getting a pozzolanic activity. And this is also very interesting, and it is something we need to understand better. This is very promising in relation to using it as cement replacement because it shows that it might not only be filling in the voids, it is actually chemically reacting, which we would like. And then there's something which, this is the, the photo of the silica sand when we receive it. And I think there's really something we should go into here because you can see it has really big lumps and it's lumped together. It's small particles, they are really hard. And uh, actually, some of them, they use a hammer and a sizzle and, and break it, and then they mill, the, mill it in hand, in the hand miller to get uh, the fine powder to loosen it, you could say. And they do this. But I think maybe we could use this process, because this hardening process that is happening there already when it's washed and dried, it might be very useful also in concrete or actually also for other purposes. So I think we, I suggest that we get to understand what are these lumps? What is it that is getting, why do we get this hardening? What is it that is causing this? This is also a major, major interesting, uh, both from research perspective, but I guess also for the use of the product. So I have some concluding remarks here. Well, use of silica sand as direct sand replacement in, in concrete, it requires optimization and it is on the workability. I showed you we cannot cast it if we just replace it one to one, but it is, I, we did not test it. It's not a part of this project, but use of plasticizer, I'm, I feel certain that this can, can help us and, and that it, we will be able to make a recipe where we can use it as sand, but we need some, some extra innovation on that part. When we use it as sand replacement, it is a replacement of natural resources. Then if we go to this one, uh, we, where we use it as cement replacement, it's not only uh, uh, saving of natural resources, it's also saving of CO2 emissions, less CO2 emissions from the cement production. And here we see that after milling, we have very good mechanical property, uh, uh, properties and that we have with 20% of replacement, I would say we have the same compressive strengths and this is a very, very good result. And um, we need to understand better the influence on the different cement phases, but it is the next step. And I think th this, this result shows that this one is actually worth going for. And then I say for both, I think this last one is also quite important that we get this aesthetically nice color. You can see that this is a sort of a, well, it's a red concrete, but it comes from a green source. And I, in Denmark, we have a lot of good discussions or had over the years with, the, with architects who are really, really eager to get this concrete into their product, products. So it could also be, but that's what we will hear about next. Could there be actually a request for such concrete? Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Otto Sam. That's really interesting. And especially when you say that the carbon emissions, if you replace 20% after 10 seconds of milling, will be reduced by 20%. Uh, that is uh, that is a huge amount. At the same time, you say the quality are still extremely high. That's very important. We'll come back with the questions from, uh, from all of you are are listening and uh, seeing the, the webinar because and there's many that are putting questions out. So please stay to the end and then we'll come back and answer your questions. Uh, we have the last external speaker uh, presenting also again from Denmark. I think that, that you in Denmark, you are the specialist in this field. Uh, uh, we have not been that good in Sweden, I believe. So, so I, I appreciate that we have Katrin Orland led from Rambo that will talk about the market potential and uh, the market analysis, uh, especially the interest for using low carbon emissions concrete. Uh, and, uh, and so please go ahead, Katrin. I would like to hear about the market. What does the market say about the potential? Thank you very much. So uh, I work in Ramble and in the water and wastewater treatment department in Denmark. And Ramble is a global engineering consulting company. And 
as uh, he said, I will present the market analysis. To start off, I'll very briefly tell some of the background for this project. And phosphorus is a crucial element for all life forms, and every cell of every living organism contains phosphorus, and there is no alternative to phosphorus since it's irreplaceable. It is especially important since it's very limited resource and we may run out of it globally in less than 100 years if we do not change our uses or start recycling it. Also, the majority of global resources are concentrated in a few countries, like 71% are actually under the control of Morocco and Western Sahara, and your European Union is highly dependent on phosphorus imports, with only 10% coming from a domestic mine located in Finland. Uh, without phosphorus, we cannot keep up life as we know it right now, and we cannot produce nearly as much crops as we do without fertilizers from phosphorus. Um, it might mean that we might only be able to sustain two to four billion people worldwide without phosphorus. It is therefore important that we start recycling it. And this is also one of the reasons why EU included rock phosphate in 2014 and phosphorus in 2017 on their critical war materials list. And phosphorus is found primarily in waste streams such as manure, wastewater, and meat and bone meal. And phosphorus is removed primarily in waste streams such as uh, to avoid eutrophication in wastewater, and it therefore ends up in the sewage sludge. In Denmark, approximately 70% of the sewage sludge is deposited on agricultural lands, and the last 30% is being incinerated and deposited in storage facilities, like Biofos uh, said earlier. However, Denmark is among the few countries in Europe that still allow sewage sludge being deposited on agricultural lands. Many countries have already prohibited this or will prohibit it in the near future, including demanding incineration and recovery of phosphorus in sewage sludge. Some few countries that were mentioned earlier as well by Jeriv was Germany, Netherlands, Switzerland, Austria and uh, Sweden. So in Germany is prohibited since 2018 to use sewage sludge from bigger treatment plants as fertilizers. And within the next five to 14 years, phosphorus must be extracted from the sewage sludge. In Netherlands, it's been nearly impossible to use sewage sludge in fertilizers since 1995. And the majority of their sewage sludge is incinerated in either Netherlands or Germany. In Switzerland, it's been prohibited since 2006 um, to use sewage sludge as fertilizer. All the sewage sludge must be incinerated and the phosphorus must be extracted with a grace period of 10 years. In Austria, it's been prohibited in three regions, and 75% of the sewage sludge is incinerated. And in 2017, they proposed to prohibit it in the entire country. And, Germ and Sweden is currently proposing a law similar to Germany, but it's still under development. So the major goal of this market analysis are to investigate which type of concrete products that potentially can be produced, which market is ready for this sustainable concrete and potential future collaboration opportunities. And to reach this goal, we, for example, answered the following questions. What type of concrete products can be produced if silicate sand replaces cement? What quality requirements does the concrete industry use or market have? For example, quality, color, sustainability, etc. And what market do we have for the silicate sand products? For example, private com people and companies, concrete companies, building water and architects. And what kind of products does our market have interest in? Like paving stones, concrete tiles, concrete stone for parking places, and so on. And is there any relevant legislation? The demand for concrete is increasing every year, and in 2017, about 175 million tons of cement was produced in the European Union alone. This increase is even though new building materials and new technologies are available and alternative materials are prioritized. 
These technologies are, for example, getting better at minimizing the amount of cement and concrete needed in constructions, and sometimes even substituting concrete with alternative materials. Companies and clients are prioritizing sustainable so solutions to decrease their CO2 emissions because they want to be more sustainable and climate friendly. Decreasing the CO2 emissions in concrete is especially important since the global concrete production is responsible for over 8% of the overall CO2 emissions. Nevertheless, many are still not prioritizing sustainable, sustainability, though the demand for sustainable solutions and prioritization of the environment and climate is rapidly increasing. Few sustainable cement substitutes in concrete have already been implemented in some companies. For example, fly ash, clay, slag from steel mills and biocrete. Currently, the concrete industry is highly depending on fly ash to reduce CO2 emissions and improve the concrete quality. But Denmark and many other countries in the world are drastically decreasing or completely stopping coal combustion due to severe climate impacts. Because of this decreasing amount of flyers, the demand for other sustainable alternatives are even more important and is increasing. And because of this increasing demands for sustainable concrete, the Innovation Fund in Denmark funded a four-year project called Green Concrete 2 to create the basis for a green transition of cement and concrete production in Denmark. This project finished in, 2000, in February 2019, and also uh, various companies and other actors in the Danish concrete and construction market has joined together to reduce CO2 emissions by 50% before 2030 without compromising the quality. And the name of this initiative is Bear Dukti Bitong Initiative, which is Sustainable Concrete Initiative, and it promotes sustainable solutions and create research projects and current research projects to collect all sustainable solutions in one place and show them to interested parties. This makes it easier and more convenient for everyone to investigate what sustainable solution best fits them and their goals, and this also added more focus on the green transition. They have also prepared a roadmap to help reach their 2030 goal, but they're still far from reaching their goal, especially when fly ash is being phased out. CO2 emissions is not the only factor impacting the climate. Various experts recommend implementing embodied carbon and life cycle assessment. Embodied carbon is the carbon footprint of a material and considers many greenhouse gases are released throughout the supply chain and is often measured from cradle to factory gate or cradle to site of use. Life cycle assessment is assessing the environmental impacts associated with all the stages of the life cycle of a product, which is from production to end of life. Analyzing embodied carbon and life cycles assessments are also becoming much more popular, which also uh, proves the increased focus on sustainable solutions. However, there are not yet any legislation demanding this, but in Finland they're proposing um, making it necessary to do them, and in Denmark they started tracking uh, carbon in 2020. Moreover, many companies and clients want to show they're sustainable, and are therefore certifying the buildings and construction through various different certification companies. Each of them certification companies are prioritizing slightly different parameters when certifying a sustainable construction. An example is DDNB, um, and they're different from many of the others because they focus equally on three different sustainability dimensions, which are social, environmental and economical aspects and I'll get back to them later. For the market size, in 2015 in Europe, 11.5 million tons dry sewage sludge matter was produced and it's expected that in 2020, it will reach 13 million tons dry sewage sludge matter in Europe. If all this sewage sludge was in mono incinerated in Europe, 
3.7 million tons to its large ash would be produced. So there's a huge potential to produce millions of tons of silicate sand through easy mining in Europe if all of it was, were to be treated at some point. For now, as mentioned by easy mining, they're building two full scale plants and uh, will and which might generate about 45 to 52 uh, million tons of silicate sand per year. In the Danish legislation, sewage sludge ash is allowed in concrete and in the standard it's called bioass and it's mentioned in for example the DSEN 206. It is therefore already possible to use silicates and in concrete in Denmark as long as it follows the standards. These standards are to ensure that for example the chemical composition is not compromising the quality of concrete compared to regular concrete or co concrete with other additives. However, the requirements for bioash in concrete are rather strict and they change depending on, for example, type of concrete and the environmental class the concrete with silicon sand is going to be used in. There are strict regulations in, for example, fresh concrete um, compared to prefabricated concrete products and also more strict regulations in aggressive environment compared to passive environments. Therefore, the possibility of using silicate sand and concrete depends a lot on environmental class, type of concrete, but also company specific requirements. Even though the regulations can be rather strict, there are many benefits using silicate sand as cement replacement in concrete. For example, it can drastically decrease CO2 emissions. In fact, replacing one ton of cement with silicate sand can decrease the CO2 emissions by approximately one ton of CO2. Furthermore, it can also reduce depletion of resources, for example, the resources used to produce cement. It can also save valuable areas by avoid landfilling the silicate sand and mining resources for cement production. It also contributes to reduce contamination of the environment because sewage sludge will not be used directly as fertilizer or be landfilled. Therefore, the heavy metals are extracted and deposited the best way possible. And no over fertilization will occur. It also contributes to circular economy by producing, uh, by recycling all the sewage sludge ash through the easy mining process. And lastly, it also contributes to recycling limited resources through urban mining such as phosphorus, iron, and aluminium. It is therefore extremely beneficial for the envi environment using silicate sand as cement replacement in concrete, especially if you want to make the world more sustainable. All of these environmental benefits are also the reasons why silicate sand will significantly increase the certification scoring in building certifications. One of these certifications is DDNB, which I mentioned earlier as well. And GDNB prioritized equally the environmental, economical and social aspect and using silicate sand and concrete will, for example, increase the scoring on multiple parameters in the GDNB certification, such as environment, circular economy and innovation. Different types of concrete products exist and the silicate sand can potentially be used in, for example, concrete elements such as facades, prefabricated concrete products such as paving stones, fiber concrete, ground stabilization, blinding layer, and fresh concrete. These were some of the concrete types that experts recommended to investigate further in the market analysis. Furthermore, during the market analysis, literature review and talks with experts, clients and companies, various quality parameters arose. Many of them are important and critical for the different types of concrete and, and many were often concerned about them. These quality parameters, including the following 12. It is no change to silicate sand and then milling the silicate sand to make them into smaller particles. The red color caused by the iron oxide, the amount available by easy mining, the workability, the compressive strength, the tensile strength, the porcelainic effect, which Lisbeth as well explained, which 
means that it's reactive like fly ash. Leaching, which is, for example, caused by water leaking through the concrete, dissolving and leaking various minerals in the concrete, such as calcium hydroxides, which can be avoided by, for example, using a high quality concrete with minimal water use or use lower alkali mortar. And then there's ASR, which stands for alkali silica reaction and is sometimes also known as concrete cancer. This occurs when the concrete containing certain forms of silica, which react with the alkali hydroxide in the concrete, and it will form a gel that swells when it absorbs water from the surrounding cement or the environment. And these gels can cause cracks and damage to the concrete when expanding. Then there is potential profit for the silicate sand and how strict the standards are. During, and also during the market analysis, these 12 parameters were ranked for each of the different concrete with help from expert companies and clients, and as shown on this figure. However, these are only estimates uh, since the various parameters might change depending on, for example, the environmental class and company specific requirements. This figure shows that the type of concrete with the biggest potentials are paving stone, ground stabilization, blinding layer, fiber concrete, facades, um, but it depends on the silicate sand which parameter it exceeds and which one it doesn't meet. To take a closer look um, on only the critical parameters, the red blocks from the previous figures, um, for the different type of concrete, uh, it shows which concrete the silicate sand can be used in, depending on the test results. And this can help narrow down the field even further when we perform further testing. Therefore, further testing is recommended to narrow down the field to find the most potential market and potential collaboration partners. The market that currently looks most promising are therefore the concrete elements like facades, prefabricated concrete products like paving stones and benches, um, and so on, fiber concrete, ground stabilization and blinding layers. So to sum up, some of the main conclusion from this market analysis are that silicate sand has many environmental benefits. It is possible to use in concrete both from the test result that Lisbeth showed, but also following the legislation and standards in, for example, Denmark. And so far, the most promising potential markets are prefabricated concrete products, concrete elements and fiber concrete, but other markets that should definitely be considered is blinding layers and ground stabilization as well. And for some few future recommendations um, from the market analysis is also to perform further testing so we can narrow down the potential markets even further, to perform a life cycle assessment of the silicate sand and find uh, collaboration partners. And thank you everyone for listening. Okay, thank you, Katrin. That was very interesting. If I summarize what I've heard now from the, the four speakers is that we have today something that is 100% waste. Uh, it be, becomes landfilled or stored. Uh, uh, what we now have seen is that we can then recycle. We can extract and use 99.5% of the resources. Just 5%, the heavy metals, need to be stored so you have enough of them and then you can put another process in place. So it means that directly when we have the first ash to force force factory up and running, 99.5% are directly able to be used. That's that's amazing, I would say. Uh, I have some questions that has popped up from, from the speakers and I will we'll start with you, Dinas. That's a question from, from Fabian. Uh, it's about laughing gas em emissions. So the question is, the moon incineration process that you are using in in uh, Denmark and at at uh, at your 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 wastewater facilities, uh, 
Can you elaborate on that one? How much laughing gas emissions are there? Are there challenging? Uh, do we have any mitigation working with that and things like that? Could you please tell us something more about laughing gas? Uh, and we know that there is uh, nitrous oxide coming from the incineration process. We have measured it. I, am, I don't have these figures uh, just uh, close to me. I have a, a colleague on the on the matter. We can answer that by mail later on to Fabian. Uh, I guess he knows already that um, the, the the Dutch uh, uh, incineration companies they they measure the, uh, the the nitrous oxide. We we heard that we were visiting once in in South Holland for SNB. Uh, and they uh, they measure the N2O and it's very very closely linked to the temperature that you are in. So we have to have a kind of narrow uh, temperature operation in in the, in the mono insulation. You have to be very in control because there's a there's this uh, balance between uh, dioxine and uh, and nitrous oxide. And we have we are we are aware of this. So we are we are trying to keep a narrow balance. But we don't I don't have the figures uh, precisely for the N2O. You said something something very important here. That is that night and, uh, that 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 we will each of you, if you want to have, will have detail on uh, uh, answer on your questions. Please put in your email address, and we will answer them in more in detail. If if you if we can't fulfill 100% here here uh, directly. Another question. This is uh, to you, Dennis, and that it's about Chrome. Chrome. If the numbers that that you showed are is it Chrome? Six or is it uh, is it a total chrome? Yeah, again, I have to say I don't have the numbers uh, uh, readily by my side, but uh, I, I have this. Um, we have tested whether it's Chrome six or another another type of chrome. Uh, as I recall, it is very low chromium six uh, content. The chrome that we have, uh, we can we can also check on that if you write your email in the in the in the quick Q and A. Perfect. I think that Lisbeth. She, she, she says with her head that it's very low numbers, but we'll make sure that, that we, we have the right numbers in detail for you. The last question I will put in to Noyao Dinas directly is, is the question about the, the skeptical uh, from, from the farmers about using uh, for, uh, phosphorus fertilizer uh, from sludge incineration. I believe it was a question of using directly incinerated sludge that was what i did mm. catch but please uh, yeah we have, we have, i think we have had the debate we have had the debate for many years in uh, in denmark and other countries also it's not i don't recall a specific uh, publication right now but uh, i know jakob mcgill at the danish uh, copenhagen university is uh, researching we're actually planning a new research project on on five year study of of how the, the phosphorus is actually taken up in in in, in studies in the field, uh, but but we have you, it's the same question you have about the sludge because in the sludge the phosphorus is also bound pretty hard with iron, uh, so it's the same. It might be even harder bound in in, in ash probably, but but uh, the researchers seems to show in small experiments that that uh, it is actually usable for the plants uh, only on a on a longer time scale. It's not fast as the the uh, for, uh, the, uh, the ferment, what would you call the fertilizer you buy in shops, but, uh, but it's, it's just a slow fertilizer actually. Okay, but when we produce it and use that to fast, we will have, uh, we will be able to then, then make it a uh, high potent fertilizer. But uh, I think it's important. Uh, that when Yaro Yaro is said, yeah, sorry. I yeah, said that the, the, this phosphorus coming from the astrophos is extremely clean, so it actually it should be used for something better than fertilizer. Exactly, exactly. Um, we will try to work on that to make sure that legislation allows that quality comes before a region. As Jarev said, we have the highest quality from the process uh, that are produced on this earth. So it, we really hope that we can use it. Uh, Alexander, really congratulate for, for the, the recovery rate. Uh, but I have a question from, from her, and that is, uh, how can you determine the quality of the recovery process? How is it done if you compare it to, yeah. to the ash? Uh, I can uh, uh, say some word about that. Of course, we make a complete analysis of the product. Uh, it's a very pure calcium phosphate. We look at all the heavy metals. We look at the organics are below detection limit. Uh, we are also uh, aiming, as Dina said, at the high quality application to use it as a feed supplement. 
And then we made the digestibility tests, uh, comparing uh, the recovered calcium phosphate with monocalcium phosphate, which is the highest value product on the market. We took samples commercially used and compared the uh, digestibility in citric acid, and it was exactly similar. So it has a, a very large potential to use as a feed supplement. The problem is that this uh, it's not legally allowed in Europe. So the only way to sell it as a feed supplement is outside uh, uh, Europe. Uh, but of course, you can uh, use it as a raw material for production of fertilizers. And uh, it's actually, as Dina said, it's too premium, too clean to, 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 to use it for this application, actually. It, it, uh, I think that the feed application is very, very interesting, interesting for this uh, product. But if we have politicians on the line, make sure that you understand that the potential to be a hero here is, is pretty big, uh, making sure the quality comes before a region. Uh, there's a question from Lucas here. To what extent do you recover phosphorus and iron? I think you had it in your presentation, but can we repeat it? Yeah, I can repeat it. Uh, the phosphorus is above uh, 90%. Uh, it can be also much higher. It depends also uh, on, on the acid doses. And of course, we adapt the process according to the regulation to get as much as phosphorus out. If we focus only on the phosphorus, then we get about 10 to 20 percent of the iron. We know that we can extract more iron if we would like to do that, uh, but then it will um, require more acid. Yeah. So if we optimize the process according to the phosphorus, it's uh, about uh, 10 to 20 percent of the iron that we extract. Mm -hmm. If we would like to optimize it for the iron, there is a possibility, but today there is no political uh, goals to do that at the moment. I think we, we, we have a question now for uh, for Lisbeth. Uh, I don't know exactly if we can answer this one because we are not really there yet uh, at the final production, but the particle size uh, of, the, of, the, of the distribution of the final product, um, I suggest that we can do it in, in any size. That's what I understand, but please. Isn't that correct? We, we don't hear you, so Lisbeth, unmute, please. No, I guess the question is about the particle you. size uh, when we mill it. And that's, uh, of course, an, an optimization process, but um, and, and the PhD thesis has showed you we had milled it to different, you know, for different times and, and then to different fractions. And it's it's a it's a, a, a place where you can optimize it. But it seems like it's um, it, it happens very soon. And in, in we have this uh, in the grinding facility. We have 10 seconds. It's uh, it is a very good uh, grain, uh, grain size, but you can mill it. And something you can also do is also when you produce cement, you could mill it together with the cement. So there's a lot of possibilities. I think the important thing is that we show that that it is uh, not very complicated to reach a very good uh, grain size distribution or a particle size distribution compared to cement replacement. Good. So the answer is that uh, the one that will use it in the end, you can make sure that they have it in the size that you prefer or need. Uh, another question, how is the residual hematite in silica sand and how does it influence the valorization? I think well at first you can say it, it uh, influences because it gives us the red color <laughs> so so this is a uh, well visually an, an important thing and it's uh, something we I've been uh, I've been looking to it not for the silica sand but for the sewage sludge as before the the acid was and what I can see in in microscope is that it's actually not reacting it's it's uh, just laying there so it's not the the hematite not in the silica sand we've not been there yet but in in sewage sludge as 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 received it's it's not uh, it's not chemically reacting it's just laying there as fillers so it's other particles which are reacting mm -hmm. i have uh, some more questions for you Yari, and that is yeah. of course about if you compare the end product with the market price uh, is this uh, is bus possible to put on the market? Uh, again, I mean, to, to make phosphorus recovery, there are many aspects regarding the economy. You have, of course, the phosphorus product. Uh, you have the byproduct, the iron, the aluminium, which is a uh, positive. 
the silica sand is also uh, one byproduct that either needs to be landfilled or it get the value if we can find application for that. And of course, we have the gate fee for the ash. Uh, today, there is a cost to dispose uh, ash. And uh, for the process to work in a, in a whole, you need the gate fee also. And uh, of course, it's a balance. You need to, to, to look at all these parameters and then you get the economy. And it depends, of course, uh, I would say that, uh, I mean, the gate fee and the price of the phosphorus are the main, uh, uh, the big factors here. And there, of course, if you can go to the feed market, the, you can get much higher price for the phosphorus compared to fertilizers. So this is an advantage. Um, yeah, it's... Uh... Good. Um, so the alternative cost is higher than using, uh, using our processes, especially if we then turn it into feed phosphate, there will be a, a huge interest because then, then, of course, the income will be even higher. That was why I summarized it. Yeah. Uh, uh, we have a, a, a question here about uh, the silica sand. The, it's, it's red now. Uh, and is it after the extraction of iron, it's still red? Or, or because the red is, I guess, from the iron. Yeah. Uh, and then, as I said, if we optimize the process with only focus on phosphorus, then uh, we dissolve only 10 to 20% of the iron. Then we have a red silica sand. We know that uh, we can also get the colorless silica sand and recover more of the iron, uh, but then it's another other economy aspect. That, uh, but it's an option that we look at and we will uh, deliver it in future as well. Mm -hmm. There was a question about the, the cost for, for, uh, for the, the whole process. We'll come back to you with detailed information and discuss it because it really depends on where you're setting up the plant and where you, where you're doing it. So, so uh, the the person that asked the question about the investment costs, uh, we need to come back to you directly in an email. Uh, I do believe that uh, that more or less all the questions were asked. I do have a question that I would like to have ask all the 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 people in the <coughs> panel, and that is of course, do we now see the potential? that the, 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 the wastewater plants can, from becoming the end station, become the future urban mine. I think you talked about, upon that also in your last presentation, Catherine, about the urban mining effect where we can extract more of the metals. So I, I would like to talk to start with you, Dines. Will you see, will you see us uh, as a future mine in the future? We, we surely hope so, yeah. <laughs> um, the, the, the strategy of, of Biofos and other utilities, I guess, in, in Denmark and Sweden uh, is to, to be uh, more sustainable, more uh, looking into circular economy. And, and ideally, we would reuse everything from the wastewater. It's not, it's not supposed to be called wastewater anymore. It's supposed to be called resource water. So we hope we get to that point. Uh, of course, the economy is, uh, is an issue. How, how much with the water, the, the, the normal uh, uh, people who are using water, who are paying for the treatment of the water, how much will they pay extra uh, for this, these processes? That will be uh, what's what our board of directors in, in Biofos is asking. So that's another issue we have to deal with. Okay, uh, Lisbeth, what do you say? You see the potential for a future mine in the wastewater? Yeah, certainly, and I think this is the only way forward if we want to take good care of our globe. <laughs> so I think it is both a potential, but it is also very necessary. I think it's uh, this is the answer, but the potential it's it's there, I'm sure. You are all very positive, and Katrin, what do you say then? I also think uh, it is very possible to use this, and I'm. Um, as, as well, very positive as uh, Dinas and Disput as well. Dinas, you did touch a very important thing, and that is that you need to have a mind shift change here. It's not about waste, it's about resources. And if we can make sure that we put resources in focus, we will then also make sure that things doesn't contain things that we don't want it to contain, meaning that we can take away the chemicals that shouldn't be there. So the resource focus will be very important in creating a real circle economy. Uh, uh, Jarib, what is the potential 
the total potential in uh, for ash deposits in Europe? What do you say? Uh, I think the potential is very large. Uh, at the moment, it depends on each country, the extent of uh, sludge incineration. Uh, but if we take uh, Germany for as an example, as Dines showed, this is the country with the largest amount of sludge produced in Europe. Uh, according to my colleagues' calculation, if you recover the phosphorus from the ash, you can uh, replace about 60% of the imported fertilizers to Germany. And I would say that this is a very significant uh, part uh, of, of, of replacing a, a non-renewable resource like phosphorus. So, uh, of course, it depends on each country. Some other countries don't have a lot of uh, sludge incineration. Then, of course, the potential is low, lower in other countries. But in general, I think that uh, if you incinerate sludge, the ash contains 10% of phosphorus. Uh, as phosphate, it's 30% of the weight. As, and if you calculate it as phosphate salts, it's 50% of the weight of the ash is phosphate salts. So it is a really a, a, a resource, a raw material for, for phosphorus. So, so I'm definitely sure that in future, um, sludge ash will be used as a phosphorus uh, raw material. Uh, Lisbeth, I do have a question to you. You, you talked about the future, need a future research, uh, especially when it comes to, to re rely more on the material. W could you please again repeat, what is your hope? What do we need to take in the next step uh, when we are continuing to, to develop the process? And we are setting up now the first two factories in Helsingborg, hopefully, and in, in uh, Germany. What we need to, well, at first we saw the potentials, which I hopefully showed you. That's a major potential in replacing 20% of cement with uh, silica sand. And what I think and my hope is that we can continue this uh, investigation because we need to make sure to understand very well that we have uh, knowledge on what is the durability, for example, of the, the concrete with silica sand. And Katrina mentioned, uh, for example, alkali silica reaction. There's, I don't, uh, it, uh, it's not that I'm scared of it, but we need to make sure that, that this is a very good concrete and it's a durable concrete. So the next steps will not be as much on the mechanical properties. It will be on, on the durability and uh, long term issues because durability is also an issue in the circular economy. <laughs> if we cannot have the concrete lasting as long as we wish for, then we need to replace it and, and then we are well, not that good off. So the next and I'm, I'm sure it, it, I, I feel certain that it is and have seen nothing which, which worries me, but we need to make sure that it is a durable concrete. And this is going much more into the concrete chemistry. Right now it is and have been mechanical properties, but we need to go into the chemistry as well. And I had opened the window to show that something is happening there uh, and we need to understand it. And then uh, then I think the, the road is there on, on the. On the developments. Uh, I do have one question for you again, and that is the silica sand that we now talked about. They comp compare it to uh, the virgin version the climate difference do we have any are there any differences are there any challenges actually i think it's it's uh, better when we have neutralizers as you did then i think it's better than the virgin <laughs> uh, uh, sewage lodge ash and it's because phosphorus do not do anything good in concrete actually it's uh, it's it's a thing we do not want there. <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, hard. It, it's uh, ensure or it, it makes the concrete harden much faster, for example, and it's it's unwanted. So it's better. The silica sand would be better from that uh, perspective, uh, from the concrete perspective. It's much better from the from the environmental perspective, but it's also better uh, uh, to use it in concrete. Good. So by by then extracting the phosphorus to the high extent by then separating also the heavy metals and everything else, then we will have a higher quality also of the silica sand. That was that was very interesting. Thank you. Uh, I think I would like to thank the external presenters in Denmark. Um, thank you so much for for presenting your your what you have been doing in this in this project or collaboration. Um, we do collaborate also with with the Biofos on the nitrogen uh, pro project, but we'll come back to that later next year, I believe. And it's also very interesting. So we have uh, 
solutions for all micro uh, nutrients, phosphorus, potassium, and it's important in the future, making sure that we can recirculate as much as possible to a very high extent. But thank you so much, uh, Katrin, Lisbeth, and Dinas for contributing. Jari, what do you think? You started this journey for now almost 20 years ago. The EC Mining was, was founded in 2007. And now we talk with an international audience for, from 10 countries about uh, the possibilities. How do you feel? Uh, I must say that, that uh, I feel that uh, time has changed. When I started to look at phosphorus recovery, there were no in place. The interest in circular economy was not as high as it is today. And I mean, now we see uh, the first big investment in Ash to Salt. It's a big plant uh, in the cost of 600 million Swedish crown. Uh, it's a very large investment in the circular economy. And uh, there is a more and more uh, countries making legislation and the opinion is towards this. And uh, this, of course, is, is uh, a great feeling that uh, society goes uh, in this direction. I think that this is amazing. We see yeah. now that we are now entering the cycle economy. We need to have the policies in place still. Yeah. We have invested in this now for for a very long time. And uh, the good thing is now that you, as, uh, as a potential user of this, the question is who will be first out? Who will use this now in Germany? Uh, uh, the, the, the silica sand is an example. That I would like to talk with you later on. So please, Send in your, your questions, send in your, your comments, and if you want uh, more detailed information, come back to us. Thank you here from Sweden and uh, Uppsala, the research facility for easy mining. Thank you. Thank you.